Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about a military force that has kind of been the brunt of jokes and ridicule. And no, we're not talking about the French. We're instead talking about the Italian military in World War II. The effectiveness or ineffectiveness of the Italian military can be viewed from different angles, from their leadership to their tactics to their unit's basic construction to what I want to look at today, their weapons and equipment. For some of the most important weapons in an army's disposal in that war, their tanks and firearms, the Italian soldiers were often pretty poorly equipped. Their ability to manufacture modern tanks was woefully lacking behind, especially as a member of the Big Three of the Axis powers. And even when they did make tanks, they made smaller, lighter, less armored tanks that couldn't withstand punishment, at least when compared to their contemporaries that were made around the same time. One of their most numerous tanks was the tiny little L-335 tankette, armed with just two machine guns. Against then-modern forces at the beginning of the war, this simply wouldn't be cutting it. In the realm of firearms, I think there is no better demonstration of Italy's issues than the Breda Modello 30, the standard-issue light machine gun for the Italian military that looks like an abomination yearning for the sweet release of death. This atrocity was fed through stripper clips in its magazine that was jutting out the side, and it had to be basically dripping with oil so it didn't jam. A special device lubed up each individual round so it didn't jam when extracting the spent cartridge. Keep in mind that Italy was fighting in the very sandy North African deserts. And this was their main light machine gun for their military. I almost feel bad for the average Italian soldier. They didn't ask for this. Now, with Italian soldiers having such poor weaponry on the ground, then surely their pilots were equally equipped with things equally as horrible. What monstrosities held together with bubblegum and string would they be flying? Well, weirdly enough, some very prominent Italian aircraft, excluding some external factors and only considering individual aircraft performance, were actually pretty solid. Early on in the war, their planes on average weren't as good as your average British or German plane, to be sure, but considering how deficient Italy was everywhere else, their relative successes in this field is definitely a bit surprising. Then, as the war proceeded to the North Africa campaign and the Sicilian campaign, Italy would end up fielding perhaps some of the best fighter aircraft, flight capabilities-wise, that were seen during the war. We're focusing on one, technically three, of those fighters. This is debatably the best Italian fighter of World War II. This is the Machi C-205 Veltro. First, though, we have to go back two generations in its family tree with the C-205's grandfather, the Machi C-200, one of the most prevalent Italian fighters in World War II. This radial engine monoplane fighter was designed to bring the Italian Air Force into the modern era, with most countries having moved away from the biplane fighters of old and into the higher speeds that monoplanes would offer. In the Italian military's call for a new modern fighter in 1936, they wanted a plane powered by a radial engine that could hit speeds upwards of 310 miles an hour and had one, later two, 12.7 millimeter machine guns. The overall requirements were basically on par with the American P-35 or P-36 two planes that had already flown a year prior in 1935. In 1937, testable designs began taking to the air, among them the Machi C-200, along with something like the Fiat G-50. Both of these aircraft would be selected for production, but the C-200 was the better of the two planes, hitting a top speed of 313 miles an hour, with its 870-horsepower Fiat A74 radial engine. 
measuring in at 8.25 meters long, 10.58 meters wide, and 3.05 meters tall, armed with two 12.7 millimeter machine guns with 740 total rounds and up to 330 pounds of explosives underneath, the C-200 was a bit of a lightweight when compared to its contemporaries. With its adoption in 1939, we can compare it to another fighter adopted in 1939, the Curtis P-40 Warhawk, which had a top speed in its earliest version, around 350 miles an hour, and was also armed with two 12.7mm machine guns. Although this was then soon changed, to add two to four 30 caliber machine guns, and later replace those with two to four 12.7 millimeter guns. Even then, the P-40 wasn't exactly the strongest plane for its time. So the fact that the C-200 only just about matched the early P-40s was a little bit concerning. Still though, the C-200 did have a few things going for it. While not the fastest or the strongest, it kind of made up for this with its maneuverability, ease of maintenance, and overall solid control, not including some early design mishaps. While those earliest models suffered from a strange issue where on tight turns, the plane would suddenly flip over and lose control, which actually led to several deaths. This was fixed in the long term with a slightly new wing design, and in the short term by modifying the existing wings, with glued-on balsa wood. Past these issues, the C-200 was quite agile in a fight, and with this agility, it was able to take on the ostensibly better Hawker Hurricane, which, while faster, was less agile. Additionally, using the Fiat A74 radial engine, these kind of engines are typically more durable and easier to maintain than inline liquid-cooled engines the general trade-off being lower power and or increased drag. However, the low top speed and poor armament was still holding the C-200 back quite a bit. Just two 12.7mm guns simply would not cut it in World War II, and 313mph top speed was okay-ish for early war, but honestly past 1939, for a frontline fighter that really wouldn't be cutting it. Plus, adding more weaponry to this design would reduce the top speed, so doing that wasn't really a great idea either. But Italian designers and producers had their hands tied. Italian leadership already decided to focus on radial engines like the A-74, and those specific ones were pretty low power so there were inherent limits to what designers could make domestically. Luckily for Machi, though, they had an ally in Germany that made some much stronger engines, inline liquid-cooled engines to boot. In early 1940, independent of the Italian military, Machi decided to import a German Daimler-Benz DB601 engine, with around 1100 to 1200 horsepower, a roughly 25% boost over the A-74. They would fit this engine on the C-200, but to do that, the fuselage would have to be redesigned. The flat, more open nose would be swapped out for a more pointed aerodynamic one. Additionally, there would need to be some additional air intakes somewhere on the fuselage, with there now being engine coolant and oil coolant radiators to worry about. And while they were reworking the fuselage anyway, they figured that they would try to improve the overall aerodynamics by altering the cockpit and canopy. On the C-200 baseline, the canopy just sort of bulged or bubbled out from the middle. On the new design, the canopy would blend more seamlessly into the rear of the fuselage. While this did probably reduce vision to the rear, it would increase overall aerodynamic performance slightly. As this new design was basically still just a modified C-200 other than the fuselage, the rest of the design was basically the same. The only major change from the C-200 to this, dimensionally speaking, was that the length was about one meter longer. Still though, with a reworked fuselage and new powerhouse, this meant that a new name was in order. 
Thus, the new design would be called the C-202 Folgor. In its initial flight testing in August 1940, the C-202, with its moderate boost in horsepower and pretty significant boost in aerodynamic efficiency, led to a significant increase in top speed, with no notable decrease in the C-200's excellent maneuverability, despite weighing over a thousand pounds more due to the larger engine and added coolant system, going from 4,330 pounds to 5,492 pounds empty, the top speed would increase by almost 60 miles an hour, up to 370. This, again, came with no marked decrease in maneuverability. With this superior performance, the C-202 was quickly ordered into production, and by May 1941, the first production models were complete and pilots would begin their training. But there were still some problems, notably in its engines, its armament, and its technology broadly. Firstly, the biggest problem, albeit not in the way you would think, was the engine. Strictly from a performance point of view, there wasn't that much of an issue. The problem revolving around the engine was rather Italy's ability to procure the engines in the first place. As previously stated, Italy largely focused on radial engines and thus didn't have the production capabilities to make more powerful inline engines, like the DB601. So they had to initially completely rely on imports from Germany for the engines to power the C202. Once these initial imports, just a few hundred, quickly ran out, car manufacturer Alfa Romeo would be tasked with engine construction using imported parts from Germany to make licensed DB601s. Eventually, by mid-1941, Italy and Alfa Romeo began producing their own parts as well, thus making fully Italian-made, still-licensed DB601s. Still, because Italian production capabilities were quite poor, only around 2,000 of these engines would end up being produced by Alfa Romeo in total. Secondly, there were still some issues with the armament, a holdover issue from the C200. Coming standard on the C202 would be just two 12.7mm machine guns in the nose, if the two guns on the C200 were outdated a couple years ago, then what does that make the two guns on the C202? They already knew that the two guns were outdated, yet proceeded with it anyway. Still though, on the later models of the C202, the Italian military did finally decide to acknowledge that there was a problem with the armament, and two optional 7.7mm machine guns could be added one in each wing. These optional guns, though, were seldom installed, and even when installed, seldom used. First off, seldom installed. The main thing about these guns, from the perspective of the pilots using the C-202, was that they added weight, and thus reduced performance. From the standpoint of the pilots, it appears as though they would rather deal with the insufficient weapon power then have some extra power but reduced mobility and maneuverability, which does make sense as the biggest advantage that the C200 and 202 had was its maneuverability, basically being able to outturn anything modern, so why would pilots give that up? Secondly, the seldom used element, even when the pilots did have them installed or had no choice in the matter, they often didn't use them, because the total damage the two 7.7mm guns offered was pretty insignificant. The best comparison I can think of here is thinking of different shotgun shots. For shotgun shells, we have three kind of standard shots. Birdshot, buckshot, and slug. For aircraft guns on World War II aircraft, 7.7mm or 7.62mm or 30 cal can be considered like birdshot. 12.7mm or 13mm or 50 cal can be like your buckshot, and 20mm and above can be like a slug. Now, as the years have progressed, this has of course shifted a bit, but for World War II era aircraft, I think this comparison works. Now for birdshot, you want and have a lot of pellets.
make up for lack of size with volume. Don't take that statement out of context. For slugs, you make up for the lack of volume with power. Buckshot, kind of a nice middle ground there. With the C202 adding two 7.7mm guns, it's like they were adding some birdshot to the armament, but like a quarter of the shot that they really should. Using 7.7mm guns can be viable, but you would need a lot of them. The British Spitfire, for example, had a gun configuration with eight 7.7mm guns, which did work, although not all that well and they even acknowledged that it had to be improved upon, which led to several other configurations with 12.7mm and 20mm guns. This is all to say that adding just two 7.7mm guns on this plane was like an insult, and the pilots knew that it was worthless. Despite the rather poor armament though, pilots made it work the best they could, and the aerial combat record, the bits and pieces of it anyway, paint a relatively decent picture, often limited to just several dozen C-202s in a given front or theater due to slow production, the plane nevertheless managed some decent successes. In the skies over Malta, for example, one unit going up against British Hurricanes and Spitfires would report 100 downed enemy aircraft, for the loss of just 17 of their own. This relative success was despite the fact that many C-202s didn't actually have radios, or if they did, they were pretty faulty. This was the issue of the technology overall, in that the pilots using them had significant difficulty actually communicating with one another, putting them at an immediate disadvantage. Reportedly, pilots using the C-202 often had to communicate by just waggling their wings or something equally archaic. In some sense, it may have actually been beneficial that the forces in a given theater were limited in the number of these planes that they had. It limited the number of planes that had to communicate with each other through smoke signals and sign language. All in all though, the C-202, solid flight performance, weak guns, lack of radios, was actually a pretty solid plane still that could match up well with a great deal of Allied aircraft from early to mid-World War II. But technology does keep advancing and planes keep getting better, and in 1941, initial design and research began on an upgrade. Because Italy still didn't have much in the way of their own inline engine manufacturing and design, for an upgrade, they once again turned to Germany for what they would use as an upgrade to the DB-601 in the DB-605. While the DB-605 was heavier and larger, dimensionally speaking, it was only a bit longer, and thus actually fit relatively well on the C-202 frame without much change. The length and wingspan from the C-202 did not change. The height did change though, and the plane actually got half a meter shorter. With the new and improved engine, the empty weight would increase slightly by about 200 pounds, up to 5,690. But the gross weight would increase substantially by about 1,000 pounds, up to 7,513. This weight increase was caused by an additional increase in the new C-205 Veltro's armament. While the initial prototype design and some early production models would retain the C-202 armament, the later armament was brought into the then-current generation with a combination of 12.7mm guns and 20mm cannons in various proposed configurations. After 100 Series 1 models were made with the C-202 configuration, 450 Series 3 models were ordered with the two 7.7mm guns replaced with two 20mm cannons, these Series 3 models being called the C205V. After the V model here, it was proposed that there would be subsequent N models that would improve the armament even further. The N1 would have five total guns, one 20mm cannon firing through the nose, two 12.7mm guns on the nose, and two 12.7mm guns in the wings. Then the N2 model 
would have just three guns, but all of them were 20mm cannons. You may also be wondering where the Series 2 went. Series 2 was to be 150 models contracted out to Fiat, but their factory that was tasked with making them was destroyed in a bombing run, so that series never came to light. But now, with another boost in horsepower, another increase in weight, and an increase in armament, how would the C-205 perform over the C-202? While there wouldn't be the jump that was seen from the 200 to the 202, the jump was still pretty significant, and it represented an effective peak for Italian aviation in World War II, bringing them to about par with even the best Allied fighters. Granted, it was a very short peak, and they didn't exactly have the opportunity to advance past it, but still. First flying on April 19, 1942, the C-205 would see the top speed jump by about 30 miles an hour, up to 399. Because of its increased weight, the maneuverability was slightly worse, but not considerably so, and it was still better than most other fighters of its era in this category. The only major detriment was that it didn't perform as well at higher altitudes as other comparable fighters, so there was to be a proposed variant, the C-206, that would increase the area of the wings to improve high altitude performance. Only a single prototype of this variant was made and it was later destroyed, and the production of the C-205 by and large centered on the C-205V. Arriving on the battlefield in February 1943, the C-205 ideally would be able to provide a much needed boost to Italian and German forces in North Africa that had been pushed into Tunisia by both the British in the east and British and American forces in the west. This was shaping up to be a pivotal moment in the North African campaign, and the Axis needed that support. However, they wouldn't really be getting it from the C-205 though, at least not in any significant sense. Arriving in February, it would still take a little time to train pilots on its use, albeit probably not as long as the C-205 was basically just a faster C-202. Still, with Italian and German forces surrendering in Tunisia by May 13, 1943, at most groups armed with the C-205 would have less than three months of potential combat. Training ended up taking about two of those three months, and the C-205 only saw its first mission towards the end of April, on Hitler's birthday, coincidentally April 20th. Flying out of Pantelleria, a small island smack dab in between Sicily and Tunisia, a group of 32 C-205s would reportedly attack an Allied force consisting of Spitfires and P-38s, numbering some 80 strong. The claimed result was nothing short of spectacular for the C-205, claiming the destruction of 18 enemy aircraft for the loss of just one of their own. It should also be said that another claim in this battle said that 14 or 15 enemy planes were downed in return for two or three C-205s, you know, fog of war and all that, hard to know exact details on this. Regardless though, their first foray against opposing aircraft went pretty well for a country on its heels. But now a greater challenge lie ahead in the potential Allied invasion of the soft underbelly of Europe. The Italian homeland was under direct threat, and it would be all hands on deck. Problem was that Italy was horribly slow in producing the C-205, and the 202 for that matter. Italy struggled mightily to make or get the inline engines for either design, and both of them took quite a long time to make when compared to similar aircraft, apparently taking upwards of 22,000 man-hours in total for one plane. Thus, for the defense of Italy, the Italian Air Force would largely be fielding the C-202 and C-200, with the C-205 trickling in as they came along. In their first opportunity for the defense of the homeland, in the Allied attack on Pantelleria, the C-205 played basically no role whatsoever. 
a great deal of the more advanced aircraft, like the 202 and the 205, were pulled back to Sicily and Italy proper, leaving just a handful of 202s and a smattering of other types on the island, and they were slaughtered. 250 aircraft would participate in the aerial defense of the island, and 57 of them were shot down. One of every five planes was lost. In the later defense of Sicily, the C-205, due to its incredibly slow production, played a minimal role, but was actually quite impressive in that minimal role. Because they numbered so few, the planes were often given to the very best Italian pilots. The best pilots get the best planes, and several pilots would claim a handful or more of victories over attacking Allied bombers like the B-17 and B-24, along with victories against Spitfires, P-38s, and P-40s. Still, though, the writing was on the wall for fascist Italy, which led to the ousting of Mussolini on July 25, 1943, and the surrender of Italy under two months later on September 3rd. By this point, only 177 C-205s had been completed, and just 66 of them were operational. This wouldn't be the end of the C-205, but it was kind of the beginning of the end. After Italy surrendered, it split into North and South. The North stayed with Germany, while the South went to the Allied forces. This also meant that the C-205s that currently existed would be split. Luckily for the North, the Machi factory that was making the planes was on their side, so an additional 72 would be made by mid to late 1944. Again, because they numbered so few, though, they weren't able to make any sort of major impact, but when they did participate, they performed well, managing to hold their own against Allied P-51s, Spitfires, and P-38s. However, as a result of general attrition and the eventual destruction of the Machi factory, the C-205 would slowly be replaced by German BF-109s. The same can be said of the C-202, and what remained of the C-200. Despite its incredibly limited role, the C-205, just from its specs and how it actually flew, it may have actually been one of the best fighters that participated, limited mainly by the country that was making it. Don't take my word for it, though. Take the word of Eric Brown, famed test pilot who flew 487 different planes in his career. In no specific order, Brown listed the C-205 in his top 20 of best planes he ever flew, stating that it was a wonderful combination of Italian styling and German power, and was overall the supreme Italian fighter that he flew, on par with the P-51 and the German FW-190. Incredibly high praise. Brown also offered praise for the C-202 and C-200, noting that the C-200 flew very well but was underpowered for late World War II, and that the C-202 managed to address that issue. Sadly, well, sadly for them, fortunately for us, the general ineptitude of the Italian government and Italian military higher-ups, along with the smaller economic base of Italy, cursed the C-200 line, doomed to play a relatively minor role that showed great promise and potential, but rather little past that. Such was the fate of the Italian army in World War II. Even when something nice came along, they couldn't actually get many of them. It's like fate decided that Italy wouldn't be able to have anything nice. Alright, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. So, last week I lost my voice, and at the peak of it, I took a small recording of it. Just about 10 seconds. So, here that is. Alright, so, this is what I currently sound like. Uh, <laughs> different. So, yeah. So maybe I didn't lose it necessarily, but accessed another part of my voice, like the Ford truck commercial part. I do wish I could have recorded longer with it, but there would have been a lot of coughing. Oh well, I guess that voice is gone now.
So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya.